Hey church, my name's Kara and I'm the communications pastor here at North Coast Church. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, before we dive into worship and our sermon, I want to let you know that our summer classes series is still taking place. We have classes offered all the way through August and some are online, some are in person. Just go to northcoastchurch.com and click on that summer classes button on the homepage and you can see all of our in-person and online classes being offered. We hope you can join us at one of them in the next few weeks. Well, before we dive in, I wanted to remind you that everything you need for today's sermon can be found in our digital bulletin. The digital bulletin features sermon notes, a place to give, a connection card to request prayer and connect with our staff. So I'd love for you to access that digital bulletin. It's on the homepage at northcoastchurch.com and it's in our North Coast app. Well, let's go ahead and join the band in an awesome time of worship.
my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing It's the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote before his death, and it was written to one of his closest co-workers and a favorite uh, young protege. They'd labored together for nearly a decade at the time this was written, and uh, this young man named Timothy had become uh, not only a a leader and was no longer just a protege, but was an incredibly close friend and, and basically had become Paul's favorite fixer when things went wrong. When the church in Thessalonica faced incredibly harsh persecution after only three weeks of Paul being there and planting that church, and he was worried about, oh my gosh, how are they handling this? Who'd he send? He sent Timothy. And Timothy came back and said, hey, it's all okay. Uh, After spending three years in uh, an incredibly important town called Ephesus, where he had planted a church and got it opened a a wide open door despite many adversaries, when it was time for him to leave and the church began to go a little sideways again, who did Paul send to set it straight? He sent Timothy. The letter we looked at last week in 1 Timothy was a letter of instruction to Timothy saying, hey, here's how you need to lead this church in Ephesus. This is what you need to do. It's one of three letters that are called pastoral epistles or letters. Titus was a a church leader Paul wrote to, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. They're really not addressed to Christians at large, although as we read this letter to a pastor and kind of look over their shoulder to see what's said, as we're going to see, there's a ton of stuff that's helpful for us. But the specific purpose and time and place was so that these guys would know exactly how to lead the churches they had been put in charge of. And at this point, Paul knows that he's probably going to be executed soon. Uh, Nero is slowly sliding into more and more madness. And after Rome had burned in 64 AD, he is blaming Christians for that and persecuting them in a, in a heightened way. And, and Paul now is chained in jail and he's no longer in a jail uh, where it's kind of a house arrest situation like previously. No, this time he's just off in a Roman jail, which is a terribly, terribly horrible place to be. Uh, in fact, uh, his, his, his people even had a hard time finding him. He's chained as he writes this, and he knows his incredible run of Indiana Jones, like miraculous escapes from danger and from terrible situations. Even at one point, the mouths of lions uh, is uh, about to end. And it's, it, it's a book that's incredibly real. I, I think it's his most personal book of all the ones he writes. And, and part of it, he's a little melancholy. He knows his time is running out. And another part of it is he's writing to someone who's so close to him that he's passing the torch onto. And what we're going to discover as we read through it in kind of a fly-by touchdown and fly-by touchdown uh, process, as you read it, as we're asking you to do multiple times this week, uh, what you're going to discover is uh, there's a discouragement, uh, there's a, a sense of just resignation to what is, and yet in the midst of it, mixed with all that, is a strong thread of encouragement. 
And, and so the big picture is he's encouraging Timothy to press on and to lead this church and to do these things no matter what the short-term results are. And he's also painting a brutally honest and realistic picture of what it's like to serve Jesus Christ in a world that's not always ready and open to his message. In fact, my marked up Bible looks something like this. Uh, uh, the, the, the title to me for Timothy is, it's a road to glory, and Paul is writing about what it takes to fight the good fight and to finish well. Later on, he actually says that. I fought the good fight. Uh, I finished well. I've kept the faith. And there is stored up for me a, a, a reward, a great reward. And uh, kind of the two themes that are intertwined throughout this whole thing are the theme of encouragement, but also a theme of reality. Let me tell you what it's really like. You know, it, it would be like an army or a Marine or Navy recruiter, uh, not only talking about the good things that are come, but making sure he talks about the hard things that are going to be gone through as well. And, and, and that's what he's doing here. So uh, you got your Bible with you. Find 2 Timothy. All of you that are brand new at following Jesus, remember in the table of contents, bingo, you can find anything in the New Testament. This second letter, uh, one of three uh, pastoral letters or epistles, 2 Timothy. You got it on your digital device, and we're going to look carefully at some verses, and then I'm going to come back and leave you with four things, hopefully, that you can take home and you can apply. And again, notice how the themes of encouragement and reality are woven together. It starts out this way, as most uh, letters of that era did. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, my spiritual son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he talks about his special relationship with Timothy. Man, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. And I, I, I recall your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I'm persuaded now lives in you. So he gives him his first words of encouragement. So stay strong despite the hardship that's going to come. Verse 6, for this reason, your great start and your incredible spiritual heritage, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For the spirit of the, that God has given us does not make us timid or afraid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. No matter what's happening around you, remember the anointing of God when I laid hands upon you and, and through the call of God, you were sent into this role. And remember that the spirit of God is not where our fear comes from, but it's where our power, our love, and our ability to live by self-discipline comes from. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me being a prisoner. Rather, and here's the reality, with that power, with that love, and with that self-discipline, Join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. That's a unique recruiting tool again, isn't it? Join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Well, then he goes on. If you look around the middle of verse 10, he speaks of, of Christ Jesus having destroyed death, the encouragement, the power that God has given us and brought to life immortality to light through the gospel. And it is of this gospel, the one that destroyed death, the power of God, it's of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, and that is why I'm suffering. Verse 12. Now, think about that for just a moment. Man, God has saved us through grace, all of him, not of me. That's up in starting in verse 9. And, and, and God has, has destroyed death. We are victors. And we have a spirit of power. And we have a spirit of love. And we have a spirit of self-discipline in verse 12. And that's why I'm suffering. Yeah, you, you, you catch the kind of little confusion that most of us would have because we, we often understand and be presented, have been presented the, the, the power side, the gospel side, the, the, the reward of following Jesus. And we've been slow to speak about the truth of the hard things. 
It reminds me in the New Testament, there's a famous faith chapter. It's found in a book called Hebrews chapter 11. And the whole front end of Hebrews is all about the great victories that come with faith. And we don't often read those last four or five verses in Hebrews chapter 11 that talk about those who were also, quote, commended for their faith, but they had none of the victories. They had none of the miraculous uh, deliverances. They died in their faith. But at the end of the day, what'd they all get? We all get the same reward. You see, this is, like I said, brutally honest reality that there are going to be times, and often it's a norm in the Christian life, where following Jesus is incredibly, incredibly hard. Notice verse 15. Paul describes his, his, his reality. This is a man who was so godly, he got to like write Bible. And so what happened to him? Verse 15. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygeus and Homogenes. He goes on to talk about Onesiphus, who uh, uh, had searched for him and, and, and finally found him because he was so hard to find, often chained in this prison. And he says, yeah, that was good, but these guys deserted me. Chapter 2, we catch this. You then, my son, Timothy, here's what you need to do. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And here's what I want you to do. Verse 2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, I want you to entrust those to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Train and raise up leaders is what he's telling them to do. Because this journey is hard. I'm about to die. You too, we find out later in the book of Hebrews, Timothy, you too are going to be thrown in prison. One of the most important things you need to do as a leader is always raise up other leaders. Now I want to hit a pause button here and take a whole sidebar, and this is really aimed at two groups of people. Those of you that have had the privilege of following Jesus for a long time, because I'm going to blow some holes in some things you've been told before, and particularly those of us that are in any leadership role, whether it's vocational ministry, whether those uh, online, you're a pastor uh, uh, of a church, uh, you're a leader of one of our ministries, or just anywhere where you're discipling and training people. I want you to look at this verse because this verse is often put forward as a quintessential verse of discipleship, what every Christian is supposed to be doing. The things we've heard in the presence of many witnesses, we're supposed to entrust to other people who will be qualified to teach others. In other words, it's almost like multi-level marketing. You have an upline person who's trained you, and if you're a follower of Jesus, a disciple, who is the person downline that you are training? Makes a lot of sense until we realize that's not actually what this passage is about. You see, we have confused two things in the Christian church that the Bible talks about that are incredibly important. Discipleship and leadership development. Now, just hang with me as, as I explain this, because again, uh, if, if we don't understand this as leaders, we're, we're going to end up with uh, what I like to call drive-by guiltings for all kinds of people who were never gifted and never called to be leaders because our path of discipleship took us to leadership. We assume everybody else's should. And, and this verse here is in what, remember, uh, they're part of the pastoral epistles, called pastoral epistles. Why? Because they're written to pastors. And we've taken a command to a shepherd, to a spiritual leader, to a discipler, and we've made that a command for everybody else. So now hang with me. Let me explain the difference. You see, the church universal and every local church, every one of our campuses, every one of our microsites, every single local church anywhere, uh, it's, it's designed to run on two different rails. And, and one rail is the rail of discipleship, and the other rail is a rail of leadership development. Discipleship comes from a Greek word, disciple, mathetes, which means follower. And, and, and we're supposed to be creating followers of Jesus Christ. And according to the Great Commission, going into all the world, uh, making disciples, followers, they are publicly then baptized as a statement of following Jesus. And then we are trained th to train them to obey everything that Jesus taught us. It's called the Great Commission. That rail is very important. There's another rail over here, and it is the rail of leadership. And if you don't have discipleship, you have no salt and light. If you're not creating leaders, you have no future. Again, the church as a whole, every local campus, uh, every ministry has to have both of these things. But unfortunately, what we've done is we've turned these two rails into a monorail. And the train tips over. 
when it tips over on one side, you get leaders who are arrogant and look down on everybody else who doesn't become a leader because that's their rail. And when it tips over on the other side, you get despairing Jesus followers who don't have gifts of leadership, have no desire to become a leader, and they feel like they're loser Christians. Because what's happened, all the leaders have told them, no, you're supposed to become a leader. Let me explain the difference between discipleship and leadership. Discipleship is mandatory. You cannot go to heaven and not have been a disciple. And a disciple is, is not a super saint Christian. It's, it's, it's anybody. It's a follower. That's all it means. The weird thing in the American church today, if you're talking about, oh, my heart is for discipleship, or you're on a church staff and you're the discipleship pastor, what you do is you go around and find Christians and make them better Christians. <laughs> Clearly, that's not what the apostles heard when Jesus said, go on all the world and make disciples. Find Christians and make them better ones. No, find people who don't know me and help them follow me. Good, bad, and ugly. Any and a few are going to be very sucky at the end of the line. So a, a, a discipleship uh, and, a, and a, being a disciple, it's mandatory. And what being a disciple is about, and everyone has a, a, a need to take, is the next step of obedience. You see, whether you're the brand new Christian or you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, or you're like the Apostle Paul writing the book of Philippians. He says, man, I'm uh, pressing on. There is still more out there for me to do. There is always a next step of obedience. And discipleship is about helping people find where they are and where they need to go next. Leadership, though, is not mandatory. It's voluntary. And it's not about the next step of obedience, it's about the next step of sacrifice, though obedience sometimes calls for sacrifice, but, but being a leader is being a servant. Jesus said, if anyone wants to set up my right or left hand, they need to become a servant. And by the way, if you don't want to just set up my right and left hand and be a leader of that level, you want to be the goat, you want to be first among all, he said, that's great, don't just be a servant, be like a slave. In the first letter to Timothy, uh, Paul tells Timothy, you are to uh, go into uh, the various places here in Ephesus and you are to appoint uh, in each of these towns elders. But he says this, if anyone wants to be an elder, if they want to, here's what they need to do. Here's what they need to be. He didn't say everybody should want to be, but here's the path up for it. Now, the reason this is so important is too often, too many of you, both leaders and not leaders who've been longtime Christians, have felt like the path of becoming a better Christian, the path of discipleship, as you get higher and higher, you become a Bible scholar, then you become a leader, then maybe you come be, move to vocational ministry. And if you're at the very top rung, you go overseas as a missionary. No, that, that's the latter of leadership. And if God has called you to that and gifted you towards that, you need to take it. But the actual thing all of us have been called for is the path, the ladder of obedience. And that's why in Thessalonians, you have this weird verse that leaders never understand. It says, he, 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 he says to them, you know what? Lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your hands so that you have something to share. <laughs> Like, oh, I thought we were all supposed to become leaders. No, we're all supposed to become more obedient. And I wanted to take the time and little sidebar on this to speak to those longtime Christians among us who've always felt like you should be a leader in your heart of hearts. You have no desire and you know you have no gifts. It's really okay. He's asking you to be a more obedient Christian in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace. And to undercut the arrogance of those of us that have climbed the ladder towards leadership to somehow think our serving God is somehow better than serving God out there in the marketplace, out there in the neighborhood and all the other places. So I hit the pause button. I'm going to unhit it now and we'll go back here to uh, what it says in Timothy. He goes on and he says, let me tell you how to suffer well. Because if you suffer well, you want to be like a soldier, an athlete, a farmer. And we're going to look at this in a little more detail later. Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And remember this, verse 4. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. Rather, he tries to please his commanding officer. And in the same way, anyone who competes as an athlete doesn't receive the victor's crown unless they compete according to the rules. And think about the hardworking farmer. 
He's the first to receive a share of the crops. And then he says, so you reflect on what I'm saying, and the Lord will give you insight of this. So look back at verse 3. Here's what he says. Join me in suffering, and I'm going to tell you how to suffer well. Remember the lesson of the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. And we'll dig into that in a few moments. Along the way, he says, once again, we've seen throughout 1 Timothy, we saw it in Thessalonians, don't get sidetracked by silly arguments about secondary or speculative things. Verse 14, Timothy, you keep reminding God's people of these things and warn them before God against quarreling about words. It's of no value. It only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And what's a part of handling it well? Avoiding godless chatter. Because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly and their teaching will spread like gangrene. Now jump down to verse 24. How to respond and how to teach those who oppose you, Jesus, and Christianity. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Timothy, make sure you handle people who are your opponents in the right way. And again, this will be one of the four things we'll dig into in a few moments. Chapter 3, let's jump over to it. He talks once again about how hard things are going to be, and they are. But mark this, verse 1 of chapter 3, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now let me stop there, because most of us, when we hear the phrase last days, we think end times. But actually, the Bible uses the phrase last days to describe everything from the moment when Jesus went into heaven all the way until he returns, no matter how long that is. How do I know that? Because at the very beginning, right after Jesus had ascended into heaven, a short period later, the Holy Spirit descended, as Jesus had said was going to happen. He said, you wait until the Spirit comes. He will then empower you, and you will go out and do the ministry I've called you to. But you wait in this upper room until it happens. Well, it happened. And then the people all began to go out and proclaim the glory of God in languages that weren't even their own languages. And everybody's looking at it and going, at, they, they were in Jerusalem for a holy day, uh, high holy day is called Pentecost. They're going, what's up with this? Are these guys drunk? And Peter steps forward and he says this, this, this falling of the Holy Spirit upon regular people, this is what was spoken of in the Old Testament by the prophet Joel. And what did Joel say? Listen to this. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Huh. The last days began at what's called Pentecost, the very beginning of the church. We're still in these last days now. So as we read verses 2 through 5 now, we're going to find just, uh, just a, a, a wild mess. And don't think of that as something that's going to come later. Think of that as actually the norm for Christians throughout history as we've lived in different seasons and different eras and different regions. He's not telling Timothy something that's going to happen long after Timothy's dead. He's telling Timothy something that he's going to face himself. What's it going to be like? Verse 2, the reality check. People are going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They're going to have a form of godliness, religion, but they're going to deny its power. And make sure you have nothing to do with this. Make sure you stay focused on Scripture, which we're going to look at later in uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where he says, All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that we can be equipped for good works. We'll come back to that. Now let's jump down to chapter 4. In the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and, uh, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Timothy, do this. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, whether it's easy or incredibly hard. You make sure you correct, rebuke, and encourage. Remember, doing it with the kindness, gentleness that we saw earlier. And you do it with great patience and careful instruction. Why? Because not just way in end times, but during your life and during our life, the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. 
Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around themselves a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They're going to turn their way, their ears away from the truth. They're going to turn aside the myths. But you, Timothy, and you and me today, keep your head in all situations. Endure the hardship. Do the work of evangelists. Discharge your duties. And then Paul, realizing he's about to be executed, says this. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there is storing up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also all who love his appearing. And so do your best to come to me quickly. Now catch this. This is the reward, the experience of the Apostle Paul at the end of all that he has done for Jesus all the Bible that he has written, all the commitment that he has had, all the faithfulness that he has had. He says, Timothy, come to me quickly, verse 10. Why? Because Demas, well, he loved this world. He's deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Christens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Jump down to verse 14. Alexander the copper, uh, uh, coppersmith or metal worker did me great harm. The Lord's going to repay him for what he's done. And you too, you, you, you should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposes our message. Verse 16, here's what it's been like, Timoth uh, Timothy. At my first offense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. Ah, but the encouragement. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that Though the, through the message might be fully proclaimed and all the G Gentiles might hear it so that that could happen through me. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. And the Lord's going to rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he finishes. I wonder how you and I would feel if we'd given everything for the Lord and the end result was everybody deserted. They were standing in trial or were hidden in jail. And, and really, except for one guy, nobody's even searching out to find me. And those who were once with me have turned on me. We'd be going, God, God, what is up with this? And, and, and what this book is telling us, as we're going to see in just a moment, is I'll tell you what's up with this. It's part of the calling you've all got. Your calling is to represent me, to bring glory to me, and to do that well no matter what the circumstances are, in the promise of an incredibly great reward and as a result of having been released from the death sentence of our sins. And once I remember what I've been given, not the death sentence I deserve, but an eternal life I don't deserve because Jesus paid my penalty, then and only then am I willing to grab hold of the suffering and say, you know, it's part of the process but it's well worth it. It's a response to what I've been given and a seeking out of what has been promised. Now that's 2 Timothy, kind of a flyby, looking at the whole picture. This week when you read it, you're going to want to read it constantly asking yourself, encouragement, uh, uh, exhortation, reality. Encouragement, exhortation, reality, and see how they're woven together. But I want to send you home with four things to take home, four kind of major principles where you can go, huh, and then you can figure out with the help of the Holy Spirit, which one of these or which a couple of them have in particular your name on it. Because I don't want to just be filling out notes with information because it's given to us to change the way we live. And that's the first thing here. In this book, we find the purpose of Bible study. And the purpose of Bible study is simply this. It's a changed life. It's not biblical scholarship. It's not the idea of having a robust theology. The Bible is a book of instruction about how to live. That's why I so often talk about it being a mirror. Make sure when we read the Bible, we read it as a mirror to see how we're doing, not as binoculars to check out how everybody else is doing. It's supposed to result as I study it, as I hear it, as I learn from it in a changed life. It's not a book of riddles to see who's smart enough to figure some deep things that are hidden there. Now, I'm not saying that deep Bible study is not helpful or useful. I'm just saying it's not the end goal. The end goal is to become more like Jesus in the way that I live, not smarter than every other Christian. 
And that's why 2 Timothy puts it this way. Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we saw it. All scripture is God-breathed. It's actually from the Lord. It is without error. It is his God-breathed word. And it's useful for not knowing deep things other people don't know. No, it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness for one purpose, one purpose, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped with knowledge of every deep truth. Of course not. May be thoroughly equipped for every good work, changing my life. You see, the problem is those of us who are zealous for God, and I put myself in that category, I've learned these lessons the hard way. We've always been tempted to focus on deeper and secondary things, which causes us most often to ignore the primary things. From the Pharisees of Jesus' day to the early church where he kept saying, don't chase down these quarrels, these arguments about words, this deep stuff, whatever, to today. There's always a tendency to go deeper in what I know rather than a more obedient in how I live. Rampant speculation, theological arguments, divisions over so-called deeper truth. Focusing on that is not what it's about. It's a changed life. Now, the second thing that we see in this passage is this. We want to make sure that we never let our love for truth drown out our love for people. Paul over and over in 2 Timothy is talking about how hard times are going to be and people aren't going to listen and and all of these things. And he says, listen, you need to make sure that, that as you speak the truth, you don't lose your heart for people. Now, I want to emphasize the truth is important. We live in this goofy day and age where people say, well, your truth is your truth and your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. That's stupid. Like, are you kidding me? You know, if I've got my truth of how I'm going to get to a destination and it doesn't match with truth, truth about the way to get there, I ain't going to get there. And if I, in all sincerity, completely believe that uh, uh, taking this medicine or doing this thing is somehow going to make me healthy and I take the wrong medicine or do the wrong thing, I'm going to die. Yeah, you know, truth is not relative. Truth is truth. So it's not that we kind of follow uh, this day and age where where people go, well, truth doesn't really matter. All you got to do is love. No, truth matters. But in the midst of our love for truth, we can't lose our love for people. And so he tells Timothy in these increasingly hard times, times where where, where people are, where Paul is dying for his faith. And later on, Timothy's going to be thrown in jail for his faith. He says, man, make sure you got the right heart. You got the right attitude. And here's what he says, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 to 26, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. We've seen that before because, you know, they produce quarrels. And this is what the Lord's bond servant must be like. You must not be quarrelsome. You must be kind to everyone and you can't be resentful. And then he goes on. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of the truth so their eyes are opened and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Now, I want you to catch this. This is so important. They've been taken captive to do his will. Whose will? The devil's will. In other words, she's not talking about how to deal with opponents who are hassling you a little bit, uh, uh, people who don't quite get it. No, he's talking about people who are not just held captive and blinded by the enemy, but they're actually carrying out his will. They're leading his parade. He says, even when you deal with those people, do not forget the heart and the attitude you're supposed to have. And now that we know the depth of the people he's, he's working with, let's go back and see what he says we need to do. He says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Even when they're doing the will of the enemy, you give them truth, but you do it not quarrelsome. And by the way, you do it with kindness because we are called to be kind to Everyone, except for the worst of the worst. No, I did a deep dive in the Greek, and the Greek word everyone, to my surprise, means everyone. And catch this one, not resentful. I want to tell you, back in in kind of the 
early culture wars, the early part of North Coast, there were some extreme culture wars, just as they're going on now today, was, was a time I was studying through First and Second Timothy and Titus, the pastoral letters, trying to figure out, Lord, how do you want me to pastor at this church? What, what, what do I need to know? And I, so I kind of took a deep dive of, of doing some memory work in the books and, and studying them in great depth. And I remember coming across this passage and just being incredibly humbled and broken. Because I realized that towards people who didn't know God, oh, very much, I didn't want to be argumentative, I wanted to be kind, and I wasn't resentful. I understood they were, they were blinded by the enemy. But when it came to those who were on the forefront of destroying everything I held dear, those who were doing the work of the enemy, who hated my Lord Jesus, that when it came to them, I was so quick to argue. In fact, I was looking for the mic drop, not to change their life, but just like, ah, gotcha. Uh, and as far as being kind, there is no way. And resentful, absolutely, that's how I found myself. Now, I want to be crystal clear on this. That doesn't mean you and I are supposed to kind of hide in a little holy huddle or disengage from the things that are going on in our world. Throughout most of, of history, Christians have not had the incredible opportunity we have here in the United States they have not had the opportunity to be part of the discussion, part of the debate, to vote. And so I, I, I have no understanding of the Christian who doesn't vote, who doesn't get involved in the process and complains about the results when we've been offered a place at the table. Now, often when we show up, people don't want us there, but we've been offered that place. I encourage you, engage, be involved. I love the fact that we have some people involved in politics that hold offices here at North Coast Church. But as we do it, let's not do it in the way the world does. The world responds to us with resentment, but we don't fight fire with fire. We fight spiritual wars with spiritual battles, not fleshly battles. The world wants to argue on social media left and right. The world wants to have a mic drop. The world wants to troll. No, we need to follow the instructions that are here. Loving truth, but never letting it drown out our love for people. Now, the third thing I want us to take home is this. Second Timothy teaches us that we should not be surprised if and when things go from bad to worse. Hardship and injustice are guaranteed. They're part of the process. Remember back in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, we saw there will be terrible times in the last days that began at Pentecost in the earliest days of the early church. And we are going to live our lives for Jesus in an environment where people are lovers of themselves, of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient, the whole cotton pick and list that is here. We should not be surprised by it. You know, that would be like a Marine all upset. My gosh, I just got orders to go to battle. It's <laughs> no. That's part of the process. You know, well, no, I just signed up so I could get some educational benefits. Maybe put my 20 years in and get a retirement. No, no. Every one of you, and we thank you so much for your service for our country, all of you, the many of you at North Coast that are involved in different branches of the military. And, of course, here uh, uh, many of you are involved in the Marine Corps. And we, we love what you do. And, and we know that you understand, you hope that certain things don't happen, but you understand what you're signing up for. And it's a shame that too many Christians, we don't understand what we're signing up for. There's going to come a time, he says in chapter four, verses two to five, let's go ahead and pop that one up, where uh, the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And they'll turn their ways, their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. You know what you're really talking about? He says, here's, here's a world we're going to live in, a world where people aren't open to the truth. And is that not where we live today? Whether it's news or sermons or books or articles, we live in a day and age where most people, and includes most of us if we're not careful, we are listening not to learn, but to be affirmed. We're not saying I want information. We're saying I want affirmation. And when someone tells us that which we don't agree with, we just close our ears and run somewhere else. And sadly, even in Christian circles, that's what goes on. Man, you teach some of the hard things of the Bible. People don't like it. They just run away. Why? Well, because that's how it's always been and it's always going to be. And when you're a spiritual leader, 
Just as he wrote to Timothy, he says, don't be shocked by it. Put up with it. It's the way it's going to be. You're going to be fighting an uphill battle. In fact, the truth of the matter is that every single Christian is going to actually lose their last battle. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26 talks about the last enemy that we will face. And what is it? The last enemy to destroy it is death. Death is going to beat every single one of us. It's beaten every Jesus follower and every human being since the time of Adam and Eve. But those of us that follow Jesus, that defeat's going to be followed by an incredible victory. But it still is a defeat. Death is not like, oh, what a great thing. Well, we sometimes cliche say that. No, it's not a good thing at all. It's a damnable thing. It's what the enemy brought in. It's his last shot. There was no death before the fall of Adam and Eve. There will be no death in heaven. Death is a part of this horrible fallen world that we live in where Satan is called even in one of the Corinthians letters, the God of this world. And guess what? No matter how spiritual you are, how spiritual I am, I'm going to lose that battle and so are you. That's a harsh and brutal reality. But the encouragement is, I'm going to wake up in the presence of the Lord. See, one of the things we need to understand about spiritual giants is they deal with the reality, the discouragement, the resignation that we see in Paul's letter here. Spiritual giants are spiritual superheroes of today. They get discouraged, depressed. They have spiritual dry spells. They have fear. They sometimes lose the battle. But they don't quit. And that's what he's telling us to do. And I want to close it by taking a look at how you and I can suffer well. I read earlier from chapter 2, verses 3 to 7, the example of the soldier, athlete, and farmer. And I just want to look at it again and, 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 and leave you with what that looks like. He says, join me in suffering. <laughs> okay? What a strange recruitment, as I said earlier. Like a good soldier of Jesus. And he says, here's how you suffer well. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So you've got a soldier, you've got an athlete, and now he says a farmer. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. So let me just help you reflect on what he's saying in the midst of unfairness, injustice, and just flat out suffering to the horrific things Paul's going through to the little things that we call first world problems. He says, listen, learn from the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. So you might want to write these down. What's the lesson of the soldier? He doesn't get sidetracked. He doesn't get caught up in civilian affairs. He works to please his commanding officer. He charges a hill if he's supposed to charge a hill. He doesn't let himself get sidetracked. What about the athlete? Well, the athlete plays by the rules. You see, the temptation is when I get far enough behind, I want to take things into my own hands. It's like, God, I tried your way. I did what you told me to do. It ain't working. Thanks for the advice, but I got to handle this one now. And, and, but an athlete, no matter how far they get behind, no matter what the scoreboard says, still plays by the rules. And if he doesn't play by the rules, any comeback that, he, that takes place <laughs> is nullified. It's thrown out. You see, we don't get sidetracked so that our Jesus flag is a second flag. Keep the Jesus flag first. And all those other flags of your priorities and your passions, keep them under the Jesus flag. And play by the rules, as we saw in the Lord's bond servant. Even to those who are doing the will of the enemy, we need to do things the way the Lord says, not the way the world does. And about the farmer, what's the farmer do? He waits. He waits well. And why does he wait well? Because it's his crop. And when harvest comes, he knows, he's confident, he's going to be the first to enjoy the fruit. That's what God's called us to do. God has called us no matter what is going on to bring glory and honor to him because of what he has done for us and what he has promised us. And in 2 Timothy, as you read it this week, you'll find incredible encouragement of what that looks like with incredible reality of the things that we will face. But at the end of the day, we will be victorious over all of them. 
Lord Jesus, would you take these things and help us to grow in our grace and our mercy. And through the power of your spirit, whichever things within this message have our name on it, would you just tap our shoulder and let us know this one's for you. That we as a church and we as individuals might do a better job of bringing your glory to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. As always, we would love to connect with you. One of the best ways to do that is through our connection card. It can be found in the digital bulletin online or in the North Coast app. Well, we hope you were challenged and encouraged by today's teaching, and we'll see you next time.